All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our expert talk in the course of PDA Group's focus series on sales enablement. Please keep in mind to use your Q&A function for questions which we will answer at the end of our discussion. Today is a very special round and I'm super excited to welcome a fabulous group of people who already joined me before and re-welcome them. We will be speaking about how to get the attention of the C-suite, how can we actually get a meeting with them, engage and ultimately, and if everything runs perfectly, get the final push for a close. I am so happy to be here and welcome back Amy Franco, Ashton Williams, Melissa Madian, Whitney Sieg, and Peter Schwarzer. Thank you all for joining me again. And I would love to introduce yourself briefly. So maybe Amy, can you kick us off here? Sure, absolutely. Hello, everyone. I'm Amy Franco. I'm the uh, CEO of Amy Franco Associates uh, based in the US. And I work primarily with uh, mid-market organizations that are in uh, technology and professional services. And I work with sales leaders and their teams uh, to grow through uh, sales strategy and sales skill development. Thanks for having me here today, Britta. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. Ashton, you want to go next? Ashton, you're on mute. Maybe unmute. Thank you. Technical difficulties. Um, I'm currently the sales enablement manager at Ada. Uh, Ada is an AI powered startup that helps uh, businesses deliver incredible customer experiences uh, as a startup in their first hire and building from the ground up to grow their sales team. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Ashton. All right, Melissa, maybe your turn. Hello, everyone. I am Melissa Madian. Uh, I uh, I'm founder of uh, TMM Enablement Services, which works with small organizations, medium organizations, and large corporations on developing their sales enablement strategies. I've been doing enablement for a long time. I'm actually a mechanical engineer by background, uh, and I'm a newly published author. You can check out my book, It Came From The Science Lab, on my LinkedIn profile. Wow, <laughs> and it's great. great. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Britta. Thank you, and congratulations on your new book, Supri. All right, uh, Whitney. Yeah, thank you. And congratulations, Melissa. That's awesome. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Whitney Seek. I'm Senior Director of Enablement at Outreach. And Outreach is a sales engagement platform that makes your entire revenue team more effective. And right now it's being touted as the number one sales tool according to G2 Crowd. So I'm less than a month in, but I'm loving the challenge of working in such a, a fast paced hyper growth organization. Super. Thank you, Whitney. And Finally, last but not least, Peter, we welcome you to the round. Thank you so much and hello everybody. My name is Peter Schwarzer and I'm professor at the MCI in Innsbruck. So actually, as I see, I'm, I'm the only male in, the, in this panel <laughs> and the, the only one besides Britta from, from Austria. So um, greetings from Innsbruck. Lucky man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, great, wonderful. All right, thanks, as said, for joining and sharing your backgrounds and your experience with us. It's wonderful. And over the last six weeks, we have been discussing the single elements or the core elements from the B2B sales cycle from prospecting to deal closing. And I thought, as I mentioned before, to top off this summer series, we could tackle one of the most pressing uh, points and really important issues, the C-suite. So my first question for you is, um, before we actually engage with someone from the C-suite, we have to open the doors. So this is where I really want to start the discussion and ask you, what are your tips and strategies here? How can we open the door to them? So maybe if I can ask Peter to open the discussion and then everyone just chimes in. Sure, um, uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Um, in my sense, after doing a little bit of research about the person, um, you have to find something in common. That means if you studied in the same university, um, maybe have the same friends or a friend who actually can introduce you to, to the person, do a recommendation in this case, or maybe some combined interests um, to start to kick off this con uh, conversation 
uh, with this person. It should be really personalized. Otherwise, if it's generic, it won't work. So this is one of uh, a pitfall that most people are sending uh, generic mails um, or in, in mails in, in, in LinkedIn. And um, nowadays I get tons of them on LinkedIn from uh, various countries and various persons um, where I think, oh, sorry, I have to deny your friendship or your followership or whatever, because um, you are not credible in my sense. Yeah, I think I'd really want to double tap on what Peter said about the research. You've got to make sure that, you know, you're looking into their speaking engagements and hearing the way that they talk about their business, because that helps you to speak their language which is so crucial in making that connection. Um, you can also find a lot of that information through their posts on social. So following them and seeing what they're posting. I think another tip that I would recommend is if it's an important enough account, I would say leverage your executive team for an introduction because I find that executives like talking to other executives. And if I could just um, follow on to Whitney, what you just shared. Um, it goes along the lines of doing homework and doing research. Um, I'm looking for things like uh, triggering events that will give me a really strong reason of call, a strong reason to reach out. And I'm also going to be looking at things like, um, I'll be looking at quarterly uh, reports. I will be looking at uh, investor briefs, especially if they're a publicly traded organization, if they're, if they're large enough for that. I'm going to be looking for anything in there that tells me about key initiatives, key challenges, anything that a C-level executive is looking to solve so that I, when I do reach out, I have a really strong reason to reach out and I will also look to leverage a warm connection of some kind any, any time that I can. Anything that will warm that up and in, improve their odds of responding to me. I mean, I, I have a question, um, if I can just um, um, enter into, the, into this discussion. Um, I got um, um, asked from many people, how much time should I invest to do such sort of research? So um, what, what is your recommendation? I know my recommendation in this case. Sure, it depends on the volume, what we want to sell and whatever. Um, but what is your recommendation? What do you want to, which time span do you want to invest to research a, pe a person? I actually love that question because my answer is usually as much time as it takes for you to get to understand what you need to understand. And it doesn't take that much time. Like you can actually calculate if you have eight hours in a day and you include in your lunches and stuff like that, you don't have to spend a lot of time, especially in today's day and age where everything's on the internet to find out interesting things about the person. And quite often just the person's LinkedIn profile tells you everything you need to know about that person. And I'll give an example. I used to work with a sales guy um, and he was actually based in Germany. Uh, and he, uh, uh, he is an avid mountain biker. And one of his prospects, he noticed on his C-Level's uh, LinkedIn profile that the C-Level was also a, an avid mountain biker. That didn't take him any more than you know, three minutes to just research his LinkedIn profile, see he was an avid mountain biker. And immediately the reach out was, hey, I see you're a mountain biker in this region. Are you a member of this thing? And they just started to have a conversation about mountain biking before he even remotely got into the pitch that he was talking about. Because people want to buy from people that think they like them and that they're related to. I mean, it's a human, it's a human business. So that's all the time it took him. It doesn't take a lot. I think too, to, to just jump on that, uh, you talk about it being a human business. I think before we even get to research, you want to prepare the mindset that like, these are humans, you know, uh, you will earn the right to anyone's time if you're providing value and a C-suite person has a little less time. And so when you're thinking about engagement and you're thinking about how you're going to get in there, think about respecting, you know, what they're going through, the time they have, the types of challenges they're facing, know their industry, know the trends. And when you get that face time or when you're trying to get that face time, it should be with a pointed effort to, I'm trying to deliver value because I understand your challenges and many C-suites like you that I know that I'm with are struggling here too. And so you have to also have that mindset to not be terrified <laughs> or like they have all the answers and you're humbly asking for some time. You're there to offer their business value and that is worth their time. The, the average executive, I was doing some research, the average executive spends over 25 hours per week in meetings. So Ashton, to your exact point, um, it, it's thinking of ourselves as a peer, taking the mindset of being a peer 
and uh, really coming to the table with a strong reason why we should we should be earning some time on their calendar. Aishna, I really like what you said, delivering value to the customer. If, if you are not able to deliver any value, I guess you won't get any connection to this customer. Are you in the same opinion? Everybody here or? I think 100%. I think something that, you know, I often use to my reps, I remember my first, my first job selling into the C-suite and then my next job reporting into the C-suite, how different <laughs> those two worlds were. Um, but something that I used to say is if you don't feel like this is going to be transformational for their business, if you don't feel like you're truly solving a problem, if you don't feel that energy to go, no, you need this now and it's important, mm -hmm. then they're not going to feel that from you. So you do what you have to do to prepare yourself to be that passionate about making a change for your customer. And that's what delivering value is in B2B, right? It's solving a big problem together. I mean, I mean, this, this leads me to maybe another point. Um, uh, social listening. So you have to listen to the voices of those possible customers. How how do you manage this? Um, or you think, can we manage this, that we are at the right time and the right spot to deliver this value to the customer? Because most of the sales uh, people, I guess, they are not so highly skilled with research or um, uh, um, a so, a social readiness, if you want to call it in this, in this direction, um, how can we easily can give them a quick tip or what would be your quick tip on social listening? Yeah, I, I guess I would jump in to say, um, how would you get someone's, how would you want someone to get your attention, right? We, we're still human. Uh, if someone rushes me in the middle of me walking down the street to chase me down for something, that's an interruption in my day. Um, and if I'm truly trying to make connection with someone, I need to understand what they care about. It's not about me, it's about them. And so that focus on the customer is, is generally where the social listening gap is, right? Someone is focused on themselves, on their end goal, on what they want to get out of that sale. And they're not focused on am I truly providing something of value to the other person? And I think that goes with any interaction you have with another human being. <laughs> yeah, something that Ashton just said, uh, I agree with all of that, but in particular, um, no, I, I tell clients this all the time, nobody cares about you. In the most polite way, <laughs> nobody cares about you. Uh, if you don't make it about the buyer, the person, the C-level person you're trying to talk to, um, they, they don't care about you. They, they don't know you. You just call them out of the blue. It's, it's like, why should I talk to you? If you're not providing that value, if you're not framing it in <clears throat> their context, as a C-level person, I'm like, great. Uh, I, I love that you like you, but this is about me and doesn't, I, I don't get how this relates to me. So delete. <laughs> okay. I think that's also perfectly charming in here with Although we are acting virtually right now, we should still think, hey, we are speaking to the people, the human, and as said before, you're not chasing anyone down the road to meet them, say, hey, I have this for you. You would never do that. So always think also, how do you actually approach somebody face to face? And that's how you would engage with someone also virtually to open it. Okay, great. Thank you everyone for this insights here. So. If we imagine now that we actually managed to open the door and we do have this meeting scheduled, what are some, maybe some funny stories from your experience you want to share when you had those C-level meetings? And also tips on how can we improve the engagement when we actually have the available time available for us? So maybe Ashton, do you want to answer first here? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I think I mean, there's, there's a couple things, so I'll, I'll just choose one. Uh, I think one of the first ones that often I see um, a meeting tank is you forget to lay out the risks and the benefits of what you're doing. You know, a C executive is going to be weighing the opportunity cost. They're going to be weighing how is this going to negatively impact my business and is that impact okay for what I'm about to gain? Um, you're not able to position yourself as an expert or even a trusted advisor if you aren't shining light on what's also the cost of, of doing this business. And I think when you're talking about um, a C-suite executive, you know, you're coming to that table as a peer, really evaluating a situation and you lose credibility so quickly uh, if it's only sunshine and rainbows and, and not real uh, and tactical about their business. Great, thank you. 
Anyone feel like, Oh, go ahead, Whitney. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like um, I've got a really silly anecdote that goes along with this, but a lot of it ties into what Ashton was saying too. My line is always get on their level, right? I want to make sure that we're talking the same language as the sea levels, but I actually have a story where there's a physical manifestation of this where... Earlier, Ashton, you mentioned the uh, human connection, right? And there's still this stereotype of some sea level executives that can be a little quirky. And I've, I've experienced this uh, pretty hands-on where I worked with folks that sometimes used intimidation tactics. And one time I had this CRO that literally did push-ups in the room when you tried to sell to them. And so instead of being intimidated by that and, feel, and feeling like disengaged, I actually sat on the ground to get at eye level with the C-level executive. And what we were talking about solved the challenges, got him to quit his workout, stand up with me. And that's a win in my book. Um, but I think if we get down to the lesson behind it, the pitfall is that sellers often, their experience is often when you, when you treat them like other personas, when you treat the C-levels like other personas or end users, and you get too into the weeds, it's tale as old as time that sellers really struggle with doing that feature focus. And so the C-level executive will likely never be in the tool that you're trying to sell. So like Ashton said, you really have to hone in on the cost, the risk and the revenue to their business. And uh, to, to tag on to what Whitney, you just shared, um, I think this goes along with one of the things I see pretty often and I've, I've made this mistake myself, not planning enough for the meeting. You, you, you did all the work to land this meeting with, it could be a CEO, it could be, you know, in my case, maybe a chief sales officer, and really planning for success in a really standout first meeting. And, and a quick story about that is, um, in, in today's virtual world, so many of my meetings, if not all of them, are being done in Zoom, like what we're doing here. So I had this meeting, it was 30 minutes, that, that, was, that was all the time that I got. I had four or five uh, partners in a, uh, in a professional services firm that were in this meeting and I had 30 minutes and I, I was actually presenting, presenting some proposal ideas for this particular meeting. And um, I did some prep work ahead of time and I actually ran through what I wanted to share and I realized as I was prepping, I was way over time. And had I not done that prep, before going into the meeting, it would have been a complete disaster. I would have been over time. I wouldn't have been able to move anything forward. So doing the prep ahead of time, even though it took time to do that, saved me and helped me to be successful in the actual meeting. I mean, I, I can't agree with that enough. Like the first pass, the second pass, and the third pass is when you get to what's the one idea you really wanna get across. And I think when you're in a meeting with executives, what is the one thing that people need to leave with? Our attention span is so short today. Uh, it needs to make impact. It's not, you know, a two page story. It's if you leave with nothing today, you need to know this and, and this is how we're going to move forward. Um, yeah, I actually had an advocate help me plan for that. And uh, she gave me the, the two things that I needed to, to walk out with. Had I not known those two things, I, I would have gone on tangents and I wouldn't have been nearly as focused. Yeah. I will say a common pitfall, I agree with everything that everyone's been saying, and, and a common pitfall that I see quite often is assuming that just because you have got the C-level person doesn't mean that that C-level person wants to make any changes to their business. It, it's, um, you might have the best pitch, you might have your one or two things that you got down, but if they think they're awesome and they have absolutely no desire to change the way they're doing things, it's going to be completely like on deaf ears. Um, so either having a really compelling story that you tell that C-level person that gets them to think about, hey, you're actually not all that. You need to make a change and do things differently. And here's why. Uh, otherwise, it could just fall completely on deaf ears. I, I love that, to. Melissa. I think yeah. that sorry. <laughs> I love that because I think, you know, C-level executives themselves are storytellers. You think about, you know, their role in their organization as being this motivational, inspirational speaker. They want those stories to tell at those events. And so they really like lean into that and, and listen to that when you're sharing those compelling stories. You know, it's so true. I mean, over preparation could also be risky a little as well, because um, uh, in 
on the one, on one hand side you want to be perfectly prepared but the, on on the other hand, hand side you want to be credible so sometimes it's really a, a trade off between those things so um in and in this terms i like to do a little bit more research in the type of person what is sitting opposite to me uh, what does he need? Does he does he need um, more credibility or a structured plan or um, how is how is he acting? As you mentioned before, I totally agree with that. That you listen to how he speaks in front of people and how he is prepared to more or less face him with the same situation. And uh, but a pitfall could be over preparation as well, in my sense. I think uh, that ties back. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I think that ties back to your comment earlier around like how much time do you spend on it, right? And it really depends on prioritization of the account that you're targeting. If this is a really good fit for your company, then I don't think it is a risk to overprepare. But if it's if it is something that's a lower prioritization um, in your in your account book or um, based on the needs of the business or your ICP, like then sure, I could see that definitely being a risk. I think to, to just address there too, um, over preparation obviously usually means you don't know your end goal. And so if someone is taking too much time preparing, it really means they're not efficient. And it might mean that you need to have done more research, uh, it might mean that you don't have enough information to really truly prepare. And so you're going in circles and not really able to, to, to hone in on what you're trying to accomplish. Like preparation shouldn't be by the time you have a meeting, hours of research. It should be, am I paring down my message? Am I hitting the points I want to? Um, you know, has anything new changed in the business between my last call and the meeting I'm about to go to? Do I still know who's in the room? Have I checked in with my champion the day before, or the morning before to see what's changed? It's not, what am I going to say? And if you're doing that, you're not ready for this meeting and, and that's different. <laughs> Great. So if we take this, avoid over preparation, however, we still need to prepare, we need to practice all those things, which ties us back to the overall topic of sales enablement. How do you think um, that sales enablement can actually prepare those me or support the salesperson in uh, before the meetings? How could we give the right assets to the people when they step into this meeting. So maybe Whitney, you can share some insights on that side for, for, uh, with us here. Sure, I think it comes down to when you're in enablement, there's a few different vantage points that you have to look through the lens of. You need to understand the leadership role, the cross-functional leaders within your business and the desires like they're, they're putting to market that message. You need to understand the customer perspective as well and the seller perspective. And so when you have those three vantage points, you can usually come up with a pretty comprehensive plan in order to target the right type of materials or support tools. I also think there's, there's this concept of leaders really caring about their teams right now. And so creating a groundswell means um, sometimes what you can do is look at the logos that are on their site and who they're caring about the companies that they're selling into and that they're touting. And if you have common customers in that, leaning into those stories around how you've supported them, um, helping to narrow the focus of the seller towards those more impactful stories is gonna be what's really helpful to them. I, I think too, enablement offers a great, a great ground for, you know, obviously offering process to facilitate that preparation. Um, but I think practice is, is so important. Um, and, you know, we don't want you necessarily practicing on every C-suite in our pipeline. And so um, I used to say like with, I was a trainer in a previous role that my batting practice is about getting you comfortable with not keeping the peace. Right? I don't want you to come into a meeting with a C-suite and try to appease them and make them feel great and tell them that everything is working. You have to be ready to be in a state of challenge. And while there's coaching, there's assets, there's research, that piece was the piece that I spent the most on. You have to be comfortable with someone going to bat, knocking down your prospect, knocking down your proposition, and you telling them what to do. Because at the end of the day, you're positioning yourself in front of a C-suite is like, I'm telling you what to do for your business based on what I know. And unless you have more information, help me understand what your plan is if you're not going to do this. And that is probably one of the biggest ways that enablement can help prepare someone. Great. I love that you brought in the aspect of coaching because I think there's so much power in there to actually uh, transform the way a salesperson 
perceives themselves and how they actually step into those meetings. Sorry, Melissa, for interrupting. No, that, that's fine. To, to me, it's, uh, and again, maybe I have a, a biased lens towards engineering because that's, that's where I sort of come from. But to me, enablement um, can make things just more efficient for the seller and whether that's through process, but just through the number of things they have to do in order to make their lives easier. Um, efficiency gains are all about reducing the things that I have to do in order to uh, get to the end goal of what I'm trying to accomplish. So the enablement can reduce friction, can make it easier for reps to find things, um, coach them, practice with them, uh, help eliminate some of the extra steps in a process if those process steps are not necessary. Uh, those are uh, enablement can take a really great role in improving all of these little things that that happen throughout a seller's activities, uh, so that the seller feels like, oh, I'm not you know spending 17 million cycles on trying to close an opportunity. My enablement person has actually helped me by improving process by training me up on certain skills by coaching me and making sure that I get used to the idea of challenging my C-level, uh, et cetera. Okay. In, in my sense, I, I see it um, as you see it. Um, um, it's more a question like um, utility maximization. So um, uh, lower the costs or distribute the scar resources, what we have to get the best benefit out of it. And um, sales enablement helps us in this direction to uh, to do a, um, a utility maximization in in this case, um, and uh, so all the technical things and what you said before the coaching thing in sports it is it's the same. If you don't practice, you won't be good, and uh, so you find you have to find some internal system or a sparring partner where you can practice all those meetings and prepare it. And uh, Amy, you mentioned it before, if you don't do the prep before the meeting, you do not know that 30 minutes um, are too short or too long or whatever. Um, it's the same here. So um, I totally agree with all of you. And maybe one, one other lens to look through, if, uh, if I'm a sales enablement professional, I would be looking at my, sale, my sales leadership team and saying, okay, if we, if we have a goal to have a certain number of um, really meaningful quality conversations with um, C-level executives or other relationships inside the organization, it's not always the C-level that makes the decision. There might be some other roles that are either part of the decision-making process or they are a final decision maker. So as a sales enablement professional, can we work with our internal sales leaders to, uh, to coach those teams to uh, put together some, some metrics that can be tracked if this, is a, if this is a key goal of the organization to improve the, the number and the quality of the conversations that we're having. So with everything we heard so far, um, do you think that in, in the light of what's happening right now, do we have to change anything on how we actually try to get the attention of a C-level or is, is there any change in our behavior needed? Maybe Melissa, you want to start here? Well, well, I'd, I'd say that the fundamentals aren't different. You still gotta do your research, still gotta know the buyer, you still gotta have a compelling story to tell them. Um, you still have to be where they are. Yeah. Uh, so if, if you've got C-level folks that are posting like crazy on LinkedIn, you probably wanna engage them on LinkedIn. Uh, what's changed is um, you can't take advantage of those in-person events, you know, sitting at a table at a conference next to the CMO, if that's your target buyer. So that has changed significantly because we can't leave our homes <laughs> and actually do those kind of things. Um, but the fundamentals of engagement with your C-level uh, haven't changed. And, and those are all still the same fundamentals. I have a, I have a client, um, uh, the chief marketing officer of an organization. And he, he said this thing that is just so perfect. And, and what he said is that our go-to moves are, are gone at the moment. So Melissa, your exact point, we don't have the ability necessarily to be in front of people face-to-face. -face. Our go-to comfort level moves aren't there anymore. So a lot of, a lot of us are, are swirling and, and figuring out what, what the moves are. I really see, um, to answer your question there, Britta, that what's, what's the change? is having to master virtual selling skills throughout our entire process. 
we will absolutely get back to seeing people in person. It might be a while. Um, so I see it as a positive that now if we can master the virtual selling skills, we now have this whole toolkit of other skills that we can add into what we've been successful with uh, face to face. I think to, to add on there too is this is a huge opportunity to see into people's lives. I mean, some of the best calls have been, you know, normally an executive who'd be at a table hard panned with you, their kids running around the background where you can see the bike mounted on their wall. Um, and if they're taking time out at home, they're also a little more grateful sometimes for like a really pleasant conversation. I think that it's not that we've lost our arsenal, it's that we have to be more human about understanding the different value that is shifted for how that arsenal changes. If I'm in my house and I'm on Zoom all day, this Zoom better be good. I wanna laugh a little, I wanna hear a bit more about you, I want you to make it okay, because I do still feel weird, it doesn't matter if I'm a CMO, that my kid's running around in the back and I'm trying to like hush them down. Those are things that I think give us opportunities as sellers to really connect and build deeper relationships also take in mind that it's harder for them to thread through their own organizations right now. Not every company is set up for digital first. Not every company is able to connect. Your champion maybe has a lot less power uh, to, to get in touch with people. And so I think you're always prospecting in a way to get that next person added to your Zoom, um, which I think is a, is a bit different uh, than when you go in person and you can pass someone in the office. I th yeah, I, I th really... Sorry, Whitney, please for, okay. go first. Thanks. Um, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head with like the relationship skill side. I think there's also this, um, this sales math skill that we need to really hone in on too, because now more than ever, CFOs are getting involved in deals because they're a lot tighter with their budgets. Like if we're looking at what's really changed right now, um, people are tighter with their budgets. And so we need to be tighter with our ROI justification and quantification of the value that we, we provide, which means we've got to do a better job of understanding our customer success in order to build those stories to share back with the sales team. And that's why I think like roles like revenue enablement are so important because we help to bridge those gaps and we help to like bring the, the full customer journey full cycle back to the beginning and share it out. And so right now that's where I'm seeing the biggest uh, like change or focus or impact is how do you really use those metrics on the call and talk numbers and help them understand what this means for their business? Um, so just wanted to zone in on that. Um, from, from my point of view, it's still a question how fast people can adapt to the new medium how they communicate and um, companies have to invest a lot in these things to um, bring their salespersons into this virtual selling process um, at the moment. And they can now benefit from it because the needs at the companies are still there. Um, maybe they changed a little bit, some, some a little bit to the left or to the right, but there are still some needs. And uh, to address those needs, we just have a different channel and a different medium in this case. And it's for sure a matter how fast um, uh, salespeople um, can adapt to, to the new systems, what they can use. And this can cause a competitive advantage for uh, one or the other company. Um, at the moment, um, I, I'm not sure how it looks like in five years. Maybe it it sticks the same like what we learn now, or it shifts back to in-person meetings. Maybe the in-person meetings shift back in the sales funnel in in the loyalty thing, or custom experience, um, uh, not in the sales process at all. Um, so I'm not sure how future develops, but at the moment, I think you can generate a competitive advantage by um, sh fast adopting to uh, the new mediums. Well, I think we have to be a little cautious about time. We are having a great discussion, but time is running by so fast. And I still want to bring in maybe one question from our audience, what I just saw, and I'm just going to throw it in for a quick um, answer from any of you. And is uh, most C-suites have a, gold um, a gatekeeper. So how do you actually recommend to overcome those gatekeepers to get an uh, appointment or a meeting? Anyone wants to start? Um, I think I'll add a two cents here that uh, your gatekeeper is not your adversary. 
uh, they sometimes are the most helpful people to teach you about the person that you're going to connect with. And so uh, I think an error I see often is people um, don't treat them with enough respect in the deal, don't understand the influence that they actually do have on the person that they are supporting, um, and it, it hurts them later. So you actually, you know, if you if you get to talk to that person, ask them for help. You know, uh, you you can get insight, you can get insight into their calendar, into what else they're working on, into who they are, into their working style. There's tons to be gathered from your gatekeeper. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree. The gatekeeper quite often knows more about what's going on in the organization than, than the C-level person does. Um, certainly the, the best uh, EAs and, and uh, you know, assistants to the CEOs and CMOs and stuff like that, they know everything that's happening in, in the organization. So quite often, I would 100% I would agree with Ashton, um, use them or leverage them as an asset, not as an adversary. And be treat them with respect and um and ask them for help you know sort of that jerry Maguire, help me help you <laughs> uh, come at it from that you know like um provide the same value and be just as human as you would with the c-level person Great, wonderful and, and, in, and in, in addition i'll share um there there are always other ways to connect I will look for a, a um, I will look for a warm connection either inside or sometimes it comes outside of the organization. If they are high level, they might sit on boards. They have other, they're they're in the community at large. Uh, so I'm looking for other ways to connect in addition to learning from the gatekeeper. Right. Whitney, you want to share something with us here? Um, sure. I think that you guys hit on it though, but Melissa, I, I liked your point around adding value to them, right? Because what they might find valuable is a little bit different. Um, but they're a key persona in the sales process if they're the ones that hold the, the access to the C-level executive. So if there's a way to add value to build that relationship there, having that same respect and treating them that same way, I agree. Well, okay, then, then I add um, uh, um, something to this topic. Um, in, in my sense, it depends on the company if we need the gatekeeper or not. Um, uh, depends on the, how this, as the C, um, C level um, 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 person is, um, is ticking, is working. If he's the guy who knows what's running, I don't need the gatekeeper. So I don't see um, 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 it in the most cases, what I have faced so far, I don't see the gatekeeper somehow in the role what we have back in the days where they make appointments for the boss or whatever, for the CEO and so on. Nowadays, LinkedIn and all those tools help us to avoid those people, to go direct to, to the persons up there who, who make decisions. I, I agree in big companies, yes, um, you have to address the gatekeeper, but um, in SMEs, I'm not actually sure if we have to address the gatekeeper at all. Mm -hmm. So it's not the key to the problem for every company. Yes, very, I think very. I want to. Oh, go ahead, Ashton. In. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, the gatekeeper isn't always the EA. The gatekeeper could be someone you didn't expect in the deal who's blocking you. The gatekeeper would be someone who holds keys you didn't know existed. Um, you know, I talked about this in negotiation. You need to know who's going to be impacted by this deal, who stands to impact this deal, and what is moving and changing. Your gatekeeper could change. Um, you, know, you might have had access to the CEO at one point, and now you have a new gatekeeper, procurement. Maybe you had access to the, the director who's going to put this through, and now you have a new gatekeeper, his boss. Um, there, there are different types of gatekeepers, not just one to the initial prospect. I think we want to just consider the, the evolution of the role of the gatekeeper, especially in the era that we're in now. They're not just managing time. They're managing priorities that maybe that person just can't do it all. Right. One of the, one of the very, very briefly, one of the add-ons that I would say, it just goes back to social listening and LinkedIn. Um, if you have a first degree connection to one of these decision makers, C-level or otherwise, uh, one of the ways that I've been working on connecting is using the, uh, the audio messaging feature in the mm -hmm. LinkedIn mobile app, just leaving a short, I think you get 60 seconds, leaving a short message for, for that person. It has just been another, another way to get direct access 
uh, social media has definitely taken some of the hierarchy out of access to people. So that that's something that I've been working with recently. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. And I hope the answer, uh, the question is answered properly now for everyone. Um, I really want to ask you to give us one final statement on the topic for today. So we are almost on time. Not very on time, but almost on time. So maybe we just go the other way around of the introduction round and kick it off with Peter and then go backwards. Your final statement, really briefly. Uh, it's a good. It's a good question. And to I guess um, uh, credibility, be honest, um, and don't be shy to contact somebody. Um, uh, we heard that we uh, that you have to prepare for it, but don't. Don't be afraid to contact somebody. So those are more or less the things what you should take from this series um, and then engage and negotiate and all the other topics what we discuss, I guess. But um, to, to bring the, um, the ball into the game, I guess you don't have to be afraid of setting the first step in one way. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Whitney? First, I've learned so much on this call like you guys are all so smart so thank you all for for this um i'd say like my summary statement is like understand the person understand the pain speak their language and use the data and social proof to share best practices because during something like this like a pandemic we're all in it together and so that type of sharing is so crucial and i i feel like that's what i got today out of this call too great thank you whitney melissa uh, my one final thought I will leave you all with is nobody cares about you. Um, if, if I'm the C-level person, you need to put your, your solution in context of the value it's going to provide to me and not what you are going to do. It's what, what's going to happen to me and why I should care. Great. Ashton? I would say similar to what I said in negotiation, understand the moving parts, understand the value that you're providing. And when you understand that, this shouldn't be so scary or complicated. You're, you're gonna know your way forward quite clearly. If the way forward isn't clear, you probably have more to learn about the pain you're solving. Great, and Amy, you're one. All right, I will say that our, our mindset is so crucial all the time, but especially this time, uh, our, our thoughts, what we're taking in, everything that happens up here is come through in our sales behaviors, in the impact that we can have on our prospects and clients. So manage your mindset and uh, have the courage to stay market forward and truly serve your clients. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining and for sharing your insights, your background and experience with us. I think it's wonderful and such a gift for all the audience which is with us today. Thank you again for joining. All right, this was the last one for the summer series, but stay tuned. We have a next one coming up. Stay out there on social media. We will post it and we will share all the insights there. Thank you again and have still a safe summer. Stay safe, stay healthy and see you soon again. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.